Intimacy brings fruit. Intimacy yields, produces, whichever word you'd like to use. Intimacy brings fruit. So in the Bible, they often refer to like children as the, the fruit and, 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 but it's like you get the point that it's like something is produced from intimacy. We see this in, in marriage, right? Like babies don't just happen, okay? When people don't get married, babies don't just show up on their front door, right? We know this. So it's like, what, ha- <laughs> what? So what happens though, right, is there's intimacy. Intimacy is what produces fruit. Now, I, I prepped you to be mature is because just follow me in this analogy. We're talking about intimacy with Jesus, so don't get weird with this, right? But it's like intimacy, intimacy with Jesus produces fruit because God has called us to be people that produce fruit. Look with me in John chapter 15. John 15. read a few verses. This is Jesus talking and he says, I'm the vine. Listen to like how many times the word fruit is mentioned in these verses. Fruit is is what is being produced from your life. I'll spend more time talking about that once you see how many times it's mentioned here. So Jesus says, I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes. If you want to, you can like underline in your Bible every time you see the word fruit. He prunes every branch that does bear fruit. He prunes that it, be, that it may be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, abide means like remain, be connected with Jesus, have intimacy with Jesus. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask for whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. You see it over and over again, fruit, fruit, fruit is that God wants you to be impactful. God wants your life to matter. God wants your life to produce something. And I guarantee that you want the same thing. You want your life to matter. Nobody wants their life to amount to nothing. You want significance and purpose and meaning. That is like a key thing everybody wants. I, they, they want to, to matter. And God wants your life to matter. He uses the word fruit, but it's the same thing. Fruit, 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 but fruit, fruit, as we know from marital illustrations, is a factor of intimacy. It's from intimacy. And so as we are saying, our mantra is to know Jesus and make him known. We have the idea of making him known and people knowing about Jesus. We just shared many different like shout outs of people that are just leading people to the Lord, inviting people to church, impacting football teams. That's fruit. That's fruit. But fruit doesn't just come about just by happens chance. It doesn't just happen. Fruit comes from intimacy with Jesus. We make Jesus known because we know Jesus. We can make Jesus known only because we know Jesus. And so these aren't two separate ideas. Is that, yeah, we, we, we know Jesus and we're about Jesus and we learn about Jesus. And oh yeah, we also like to, to tell people about him. No, 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 no. If you want to tell people about Jesus, if you want your life to matter, if you want to make an impact and do something significant, which you do, then we have to, we have to like center it around the idea and I know I'm going back to what we talked about in our, in our last series, but we've got to get it, these connect. We, ha- we have to be people that are passionate about intimacy with Jesus. Look with me in Acts chapter four. These guys demonstrate this reality perfectly well. In Acts chapter four, what, what is happening in the context of the passage 
is there's two guys, Peter and John. We'll read just a few verses, starting in verse one. There's a few guys who, are dis, who were disciples of Jesus. And they, this is just after Jesus ascends into heaven. And they begin telling people about Jesus. And in a powerful way, a dynamic way. And they, they go to basically church one day. And when they're outside of church, there's a guy who's crippled. And he's, because he's crippled and because of the society that he lived in, he was begging for money. And, and so they, they pass him and this guy asks for money and they look at him and say, silver and gold, I don't have. Do you guys know the, the scripture? But what I have, what do they say? What I have, I give you, right? And so what do they do? They go over to him. You're gonna be the crippled guy. Pretend like you're crippled, go. Good job. <laughs> he says, I can't move. And so they grab him, pull him up. And he walks, he starts jump around like you're crazy. Wow, he walks and everybody's like, oh my gosh. Okay, you can have a seat, thank you, Alexander. Um, and, uh, and so they, you know, don't miss it. They, a guy's crippled and they grab him by the hand, pull him up on his feet and he starts to walk. They, you know, he, they make a crippled man walk, right? And so obviously people are like shook, you know, they don't know what to do. They're freaking out. Everybody, there's a commotion. They start telling people about Jesus. And to make a long story short, like the religious leaders of the day catch wind of it and are just ticked at them, put, you know, put them in jail and they like start interviewing them. And so this is where we're at here in in chapter four, okay, they're, they're arrested. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught people and preached in, in, and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So you can see it still today. People are unhappy when we preach about Jesus. They're unhappy as a society when they preach about Jesus. But what, what you also got to understand, we're going to get into more of this next week, which is that Jesus is actually what people want. That like, even though everybody says, oh, they have this like mentality that like everybody hates Jesus. No, 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 no. They, they hate what they don't understand that they actually need. We have what people want and that is Jesus. And so they laid their hands on them and they put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So there were a few people that hated the preaching about Jesus, but there were thousands of people that accepted it about Jesus. Come on, we're not a part of a dying thing. Don't believe the lie that like our, our, you know, we're talking about making Jesus known. Don't believe the lie that we're trying to get something known that people just don't want to know about. No, 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 no. Pe thousands of people believed and only just a few didn't. Only just a few didn't. And you can actually see the pattern, which is they were just jealous. And that's for another time. Anyways, so, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as uh, Annas, the high priest, Caliphas, John, and Alexander, who's sitting right there, um, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, these were all just like the religious people, the religious leaders of the day. Um, they were the church leaders, if you will. They were gathered together in Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Meaning, have you made this dude walk? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you, I'm gonna have to pick this up. Will it be known to you, to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven uh, given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, underline this in your Bible, highlight it, whatever. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. 
And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. We'll stop there. So these men were able to produce a fruit, have an impact, do something significant from the fact that they had been with Jesus. And it was this very fact that actually stood out to them. It wasn't that, oh yeah, you know what? Peter and John, they were just like church guys. They were just religious people. So they were like doing something unusual because they went to church. No, 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 no. The world does not need more churches, though that would be good. The world does not need more people who identify as Christians, though that would be good. But the, the answer isn't in a form of religion. The answer is in people that have spent time with Jesus, that have gotten to be intimate with Jesus, that are passionate about Jesus. Because it's when you become passionate about Jesus that you get Jesus. As we were even speaking at the end of worship, he pours into you. You are a vessel for him to just pour into, for him to anoint, for him to bless, for him to pour out favor. And when people can tell that you've been with Jesus, you begin to look a lot differently. You begin to speak a lot differently. You, you begin to speak with the boldness as these guys had. It says they noticed their boldness. They were, un, they were uneducated, but they spoke with an authority that didn't make any sense. And then you begin to have actions in a life. You, be, you go from someone who's religious to a sign and a wonder. What's a sign and a wonder? It's something that you just can't explain. It's like, how on earth is this guy standing who was crippled his whole life? You begin to look a lot differently. And this is what the world needs. Not people obsessed with religion and church and just like, I'm a Christian because my parents are Baptist. No, no, no. It's people who know Jesus, who've been with Jesus. That is the secret to actually having a life of significance and impact and us being able to be a youth ministry that makes Jesus known. Being with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus. We had revival services back in March for those of you who are a part of them, you know that they were just powerful services. Um, the power of God was, was moving and, and people were being saved and healed and touched. And uh, many of you were just getting rocked by the, by the power of God. I, I had invited um, someone, a family that, that, I, that I knew um, to these services. And uh, like, I, it wasn't until like later that I found all this out, but like I invited them to come to the services. They were not really saved. The wife, for example, didn't grow up in church. She knew nothing about church. Um, great people, awesome people, but like just knew nothing about God. And but they came to 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 like the first night. I think it was Sunday night, and. Then they, they kept on coming and then they ended up getting saved. Now they're actually um, plugged into church. Our church, the, the wife, she served for the very first time on the host team um, this past Sunday. But what happened that made, that has completely changed their lives to go from someone that doesn't know anything about God to saved and then no, like now serving in church is what happened was she came and saw someone carrying the presence of Jesus because what had happened was she came and there were people being, falling out under the power of God, people speaking in tongues. She saw people getting miraculously healed and she, she, you know, she goes and she's telling me the story and she says, I'm equal parts freaked out, but also like completely curious it is like, I have never, this is like strange to me. This is very weird, but it's like, also there's something there that I have to know. There's something about this man named Tim Hall that he has something that like these other churches and these other pastors and these other whatever that they don't have, that there's some, there's some, the power of God begin to put a draw on her. And so then at one point she goes up in to, to answer the altar call. This is at church, a regular church service on a Sunday with, with us as a, operating as a normal church. And Pastor Pastor Luke prays for her and she falls out under the power of God. And she then begins to shake and cry for the next couple hours. Her husband had a leaf, early, uh, leaf service early for something. And she's telling me the story. 
She's saying, I called him immediately after the service, still shaking and crying. She was like, it's real. The power of God is real. I can't explain it. So she went from someone who knew nothing about God, someone compl- like just did not care about God to someone that when they met, that when she met someone that had been with Jesus, that carried the presence of Jesus, it completely turned into her entire life upside down. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And so th- this, this is the thing. They, they, they could tell that they had been with Jesus. And this is what changed it for me and, and my wife. This is a part of our testimony is that we, in, in 2015, we were, we were married, but our marriage was not doing hot, pretty much on the brink of divorce, but then saw a road sign for Evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth at, at Center Branch, other location. And so you think all these little invite cards, like the road signs are just like these little tools. They're anointed. God will use them to save people's lives. Did it for me. I'm a testimony that a freaking road sign out by the new Kroger will get, will change someone's life. That a a little invite card has the potential to be a tool to completely change someone's life. I'm a testimony to it. But we came to the, the revival services, saw Evangelist Jonathan. He's someone else who carries the presence of God. You can tell he's been with Jesus and there's lots of examples, but it, it, it takes you from just a form of religion as the Bible talks about, that, there, that religion is, it, it's like, it's a form of godliness, but denying power. It's like, it'll tell you all the rules and all the things you need to be and everything that you need to do and how you need to think and how you need to live and who you can be with and who you can't be with, all the rules of everything, but no power, no power, which renders you completely helpless to do anything to please God. And so, but when you meet someone who's been with Jesus, they become a shining example of like, this thing is freaking real. God's real. The power of God is real. God really loves me. God really cares about me. My life can make a difference. And it pulls people, the goodness of God pulls people into repentance, the Bible says. And so, and so we, we've got to become people that step aside from religion, that are, that are fed up with like, you know, I don't want to play the church game. I, I've got to become someone that is passionate about Jesus because we can be that for other people. The Peter and Johns, as we read, the Tim Halls, the Evangelist Jonathan Shuttlesworth, this is, these are not just rare people that God would just occasionally use to do incredible things. No, no, no. This is the mandate for every single single believer. This is the great commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go into all the world and make disciples, not go into all the world and, and ask people to come to church. That, that's not it. It's not go into the world and get people to come to church. No, that is not what it says. It says, go into all the world and make disciples. We're going to get into more of this in this series, but it's like the fact that you can actually lead someone to the Lord. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get them to come to church to lead them to the Lord. You can lead them to the Lord at school when they're at their locker and you can tell they're upset because their parents are going through a divorce and you, 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 can, you know that they're distraught, dis- distraught. And like you say, hey, you know, you, you know what will solve your, your sadness? It's like the love of God, the joy of God and the peace of God. It's like, I, I carry that with me and you can have it as well. It's like we, we've made making Jesus known about just, hey, come to church. That is not it. That's a very small part. And that's like great that we invite people to church. We should be doing that anyways. But the, the, the greater thing is you carrying the presence of Jesus because people can see you've been with Jesus. Because they see that, that you carry something, you have something that it's like, they, they might not even be able to like have the religious lingo words to like know what it is that you have. Like, man, that guy's so anointed. They're not gonna talk like that. They're gonna be like, man, something's different about you. We had, we had a student come to our house one time that sat, they, they came from a home life that was just like terrible, literally there. They're like, they're de- they watched their dad beat people to death. I mean, just terrible stuff. And um, he, he, he was over at her house one time, sat on a couch and it's just like, man, just, I feel like so much peace here. It's like, it didn't make a shred of sense to him. It's like, what, what? He's just sitting on someone's couch who just loves Jesus. It's like, we, we weren't like, And like, while he was in the living room, we weren't in the kitchen, like praying in tongues. I mean, you know, 
<laughs> we were... <laughs> We were just like, probably we were playing games with students and throwing toilet paper at each other and doing stupid stuff. We just love Jesus. And, but people can sense when you've been with Jesus. They can sense what you, when you've been with Jesus. And so for us to go from people, okay, no, it's not like I'm gonna play the church game and just do it. No, it's I've got to become intimately involved with Jesus Christ. This is a pattern we see over and over again in the gospel. I wanna take you through just a a few like shotgun scriptures here. Look at Mark chapter 13. I'm sorry, Mark chapter three, verse 13. Mark chapter three, verse 13. I'm gonna read it on the screen if you guys can get these up there. That way I don't have to turn there. Mark three, starting in verse 13. All right, I'll turn there. I'll beat you. It'll be a race. Mark 3, 13. Ha. And he went up. Boy, I won. And he went up on the mountain and called to him. All right, this is about Jesus. He, Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might, get this, be with him and he might send them out to preach. You can look at the next verse and it says, and to have power to heal, the, heal, to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. So it's, he called to himself people, disciples that would be with him and that he would send them out. So you, you don't have the sending out without the being. You have to have the being with Jesus. And really that becomes our focus. It says he sends them out, not you, you send yourself out. He sends you out. He makes what you do matter. He makes what you do impactful. The Bible says, Paul watered, a Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's like you can be the most ugly, untalented, ungifted, stupid person on planet earth, but be the most anointed person and get them the most people saved in the entire the world has ever known. Why? Because you love Jesus and are with Jesus. Jesus makes what you do impactful, matter, important, significant, fruitful. Just by you being with him, he sends you out and gives you authority and power to do incredible things, to have influence over football teams, to lead dozens of students to church and to the Lord, to pray for people that they would be healed, to cast out demons. We're gonna get into more of that in the series, but it's being with Jesus and then there is the sending. Look in, in, in Matthew 4, 19. Hey, Faith and Zach, could you guys come back up, do some guitar, jazzy stuff? Maybe not play jazz, but you know. Matthew 4. Matthew four nineteen. Then he said to them, this is Jesus again, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You make your priority following Jesus, knowing Jesus, becoming intimate with Jesus, and he will make you into who you need to be. He he will make you into who you need to be. He will gift you. He will equip you. He will empower you. He will anoint you. You make it your priority to know Jesus, to know him with everything that you you have, to know him with every fiber of your being, to know him, know him, and he will make you into who you need to be. He will make you. Another scripture, Daniel 11.32 It says, I'll just read it. The second half of the scripture, it says, those who know their God shall be strong. And I think it's do or carry out. Yeah, carry out great exploits. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Exploits is just God using you to do incredible things, to make Jesus known. But who, who is it that does that? those who know their God. We spent time in the last series really looking at that word know and the idea that it's not just, it's not just yeah, I know about God. Yeah, I, I know Jesus. Yeah, like I read the Bible and yeah, I pray. I know, I know God. It's deeper than that. It, we compared it to like, not you knowing about a celebrity, but like a celebrity knowing about you. 
that, that it's like, that you can, it's one thing to like, that you know about Chris Hemsworth and his family and his wife and the movie that he's played in, you know, all the things, his, his children's names, his height and his birthday. That's one thing. It's another thing when he knows you, you know, it's like that you're the crazy fan. Oh my gosh. You know, that you make sure that he knows you. You go after him, which would be weird. Don't do that to Chris Hemsworth. But with Jesus, it's the same thing. We looked at the scripture, and this is weighty, where, where Jesus says that there's gonna be some people that go to heaven and they'll have done, done things for God, but then he looks at them and he says, depart from me for I never knew you. Knowing God is much more about God knowing you than you knowing him. That it's like you becoming so intimate, you making yourself so known, so, so passionate for God, is that yeah, he has to know you. You're gonna make yourself known to him in that, in that sense. To know him. Philippians 3, we looked at that scripture. Philippians 3, starting in verse 8. in the Amplified Version, gives more depth here to knowing Jesus. But more than that, I count everything as lost compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Supreme advantage of knowing Jesus. Religion doesn't talk that way. Religion does not talk that way. Of, of knowing Jesus, my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him, a joy unequaled for his sake, for his sake, I've lost everything and consider it all garbage that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, believing and relying on him, not having any righteousness of my own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals, but possessing that genuine righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And, and this, knowing this, so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely, and in that same way experience the power of, res of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share in the fellowship of his sufferings and being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did. We're, talking, we're in that series right now, right? Dying to live on in, in Sunday that I may attain the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I've made it my own that I made it my own yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Get this, all of us who are mature, pursuing spiritual perfection should have this attitude. He's talking about knowing Jesus more intimately, becoming more intimately acquainted with Jesus. And he says, all of us who are mature should have this attitude. All of us who are mature, all of us who, who want to make Jesus known, all of us who want to make an impact, that's maturity. Because immaturity is everything is about you. Immaturity is, is what my needs and my wants and my desires and my life, that's immaturity. Maturity in Christ is saying, I've got to get people saved. People got to know Jesus. My school needs to know Jesus. The people at the store need to know Jesus. That's maturity. And he says, all of those who are mature have got to have this mindset. What is it? To know Jesus more and more and more and more and more. Why? Because it's in the intimacy with Jesus. It's in the being with Jesus that you actually have fruit in your life, that you actually make an impact. And so if it is this intimacy with Jesus that matters so much so, then you can best bet that Satan is gonna to try to pull every stop to try to prevent you from knowing Jesus more and more. Is that anything that, that you know, if, if, if we've got to become uber passionate about this, then it's like we've got to realize the enemy is gonna to try to prevent you and distract you from getting to know Jesus more and more. And I've got three things for you practically that you can focus on 
and to really think through and to ask yourself, are these things preventing me from knowing Jesus more thoroughly, more intimately, more passionately? And if they are, to say, God, I'm laying everything down. God, it's, we said it to begin with, empty me, God. Like, I, I want nothing, nothing to do with my own life, nothing to do with my own desires, because God, I want to make an impact. God, I want my life to matter. God, I, I, I want to, to do something special in my school for the name of Jesus. And so if that is the case, then God, you, you, you've got to become about, you've got to be my everything. And so then to target as, in, as an enemy, anything that would prevent that. I've got three things for you to think through. Number one is your commitments. What are your commitments that you've made? And are they preventing you from knowing Jesus more and more? That would be extracurricular commitments. Maybe even family commitments. What commitments have you made? And it's like, listen, if, if, it, is, if it is something that is preventing you from knowing Jesus more, and it's like, yeah, well, like I said, I would do it. Who freaking cares? Who cares? Who cares that you said you would play on the team? Who cares that you said that you would do the thing? Who cares? Go after Jesus. I, life, is, life is a vapor. You realize that like people, I just found out today that my, my sister's husband's dad passed away. He was like 62. 62, dead, gone, on the other side of eternity, hopefully in heaven. I don't actually think he was saved. It's like, oh yeah, but you know, like I like said that I would like play, like I would be in like the play this year. Screw the play. Screw the play. It's like, yeah, well, I can't come to youth and I can't like, you know, I can't be involved in the church now because like I got a promotion at work. Who, screw your commitment to work. Who cares? I, it's Jesus everything. Jesus everything and everything else nothing. And I don't care. People can judge me for my stupid passion for Jesus. I don't care. I would rather be passionate about Jesus than anything else. I want my life to mean something. Your commitments. Number, number two is your relationships. Your relationships. Your friendships. Maybe dating relationships. Are they, are, are they interfering with you knowing Jesus more and more? Number three is a big one. Oh, I guess all of these are big. That's why I picked them. Number three is your free time. Your free time. How many hours do you spend doing this? So this is a lot. It's like Satan is robbing you. Satan is rob the system. Satan is the God of this world. The God of this world. The Bible says that he's in control of the world. God is not in control of the world. Satan is in control of the world. God is sovereign, but he's not in control. I know that'll blast some people's theology, but it is the truth. If God is in control of the world, why are people getting murdered? It's against God's will to be, for people to be murdered. It says that it's one of the Ten Commandments. So if God is in control, why are people being murdered? That's because God isn't in control. Satan is in control and he's given us authority to overthrow Satan's power. So we put, we bring God's word, his will into, into existence. We, we make it happen on earth. Anyways, Satan, you know, I was, I was saying he is in control. So like, of course, the systems of the world, Snapchat, uh, what's the new like Instagram thread thing? I don't even know like the social media stuff, but it's like the systems of the world are going to be geared toward distracting you and preventing you from knowing Jesus. And it's like, I have an Instagram, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not inherently bad. But it's like, I'm gonna make sure that that's not robbing me of my intimacy with Jesus. I'm gonna be passionate about Jesus. I'm gonna go for Jesus. Nothing is gonna prevent me from knowing Jesus more and more and more. It's like, you can be involved in sports. You can have friendships and like, you, this is not what we're saying. But it's like, are these things preventing you from knowing Jesus more? Do you genuinely feel like it is an inhibitor for you? And if it is, cut it out, cut it out. Go big or go home. As Todd White says, if the shoe fits, kick it off. Would you stand with me tonight? Close your eyes, raise your hands.